Um, so the first thing I want to say, I don't want to go into this again because I'm going to run out of time. But uh, yeah, at the end of lecture last time, I drew these pictures. Uh, I did it badly. So I thought it would um, uh, be good to, uh, um, to do this again. In particular, I, um, I put these in the wrong place. So the point is just that obviously the collinear part of, uh, of the collinear and anticollinear direction um, are set by the hard scale, right? So they all get one. And then the ultra soft was suppressed by lambda squared. Um, whereas in the sket2 picture, which we're not going to really talk about, uh, there was a soft mode that lived along the same line in rapidity. So this is just something to be aware of. There are sort of canonically two versions of the theory. And it depends on which process you pick, OK, which, which theory is relevant. And uh, this one has these extra subtleties. Um, so uh, we'll see. I may put some. Um, I have some thoughts about something I might put in the notes. I'll at least mention this when I post the lectures. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, uh, you can ignore that. We're going to work with this version today. Um, but, uh, and I corrected the notes uh, that, I've, that I've been slowly post updating online. So this, this looks right in there as well now. Um, OK. Uh, any pressing questions before we get started? I feel like soft going to ultra soft is basically just the how low energy the emitted particle is, and so I feel like there should be a continuous shift between those. But this looks fairly discrete. It is definitely discrete. It depends on the process. So you decompose your integral into regions, and you see what regions contribute. Okay. okay? So um, yeah, it really is just a matter of uh, of figuring out what the right power counting is to get the infrared of the theory right. Um, so. Uh, OK, so the plan for today is um, by the end of last lecture, I, I drew this process for you very quickly, the Sudikov process. So we're going to study that in detail today. Um, I'm, uh, so I'm going to start by just reminding you a bit of the physics of IR divergences. Uh, and then we'll talk about the Sudikov integral. Um, I will evaluate it for you using the method of regions. And then we will see that the method of regions indeed allows us to separate um, this integral, which uh, only has logs of physical scales in the full result, uh, into a contribution from a hard region, collinear and anticollinear regions, and ultra soft regions. Okay, so I'll I'll show you how that works. Um, I was hoping to do one example for you. I had sent the notes if you're curious, um, but uh, I'm just not going to have time, so um, I won't even try. Probably, uh, I should say that these lectures in particular. Um, oh, it didn't get updated. Shoot. Um, these lectures are, uh, owe a particular debt to the, uh, the notes that I cited on the first day by uh, Thomas Becker and company. Um, so a lot of these results are there. They have a beautiful appendix where they do all the integrals for you, although I definitely would recommend, especially if you're interested in this, to play with them yourself for a while first before you go look at the answers. But they're all in, in the appendix of that review article. Um, and uh, a lot of the ideas that uh, we're going to be discussing today are, are, uh, are pulled from there, OK? Um, as far as just using the scalar SCET theory. Um, he doesn't take it all the way. So um, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to sketch how you would actually uh, resum the Sudikov process in this, um, in this particular case of some heavy uh, state, say, decaying to a pair of phi's or some injection of energy that gives you two hard phi's. Um, so in my TASI lecture write-up, um, the, all the details will be there, OK? Um, so really, what I, all I'm going to have time to do today is to give you um, a flavor of the various things that, that happen. And, um, and so for the details, I refer you to the notes that exist and then my notes that will be out sometime. Um, OK. So let's start by just reminding you how IR divergences work in field theory. So the point is that if you integrate over Lorentz invariant phase space, um, uh, one loop amplitude, so that means tree squared plus the cross term between tree and one loop, And you add to that the integral over uh, Lorentz invariant phase space of 
tree plus one emission. is something IR finite. OK? So um, since I know uh, there are, there's a plus sign? So you've got open, open parenthesis. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so what does this mean? In the example that we're working with, this is saying I integrate the process creating two phi's plus one loop correction to this. And I compare that to processes like this, right? Again, very schematic. Um, it's not going to be really important for us, but uh, one thing that's, uh, that's just worth pointing out, because you may have forgotten if you haven't done any um, loop calculation since your field theory course, is that it's actually the cross term, which is NLO, right? It's not the loop part squared. The loop part squared comes in at NNLO, OK? So this, if you look at just think about the coupling expansion, right? If this goes like coupling squared, um, then, so, or yeah, if this, uh, if this is the coupling, right, then this process, so then this goes like coupling squared. This has uh, three factors of the coupling. Um, so then it's the cross term that comes in at the next order, right? Um, and is the same order as taking this process with an extra leg and squaring it, okay? Um, and it's the infrared divergences of this loop cancel against the infrared divergences of taking this leg either soft or collinear, okay? So if you're fully inclusive, then you probably proved in your field theory course that there's no uh, that there are just no infrared logs, there's nothing to worry about. But where this gets interesting is when you do some kind of cut on the phase space of your final state, you do some measurement that restricts the phase space of this integral while leaving the phase space of this integral unchanged, right? Because this is an internal, internal loop integration, but this is actually a physical integral over the final state. And so some kind of cut on phase space can give you a... Um, a physical IR log, OK? And usually it's log squared, one for soft and one for collinear, OK? So that's the log that we're interested in resumming. And in particular, these IR logs, since you have to do a physical cut on the face space in order to, uh, to manifest them, right, to generate them, if you like, that means this is going to be a log of physical parameters, OK? There's going to be no renormalization scale dependence inside this log. So it's unclear a priori how to use the renormalization group to resum such a log. Furthermore, it's an IR log. These things are connected. And, uh, and really, the renormalization group resums UV logs, OK? Um, so now you know where we're going, right? We spent all of Wednesday learning how to take a log with no renormalization scale in it, separate that into uh, different contributions from a hard scale and, um, and then contributions in an effective theory that then gave us mu dependence so we could do some resummation. Okay? So we're going to do the same thing here. I'm going to go at it a little bit uh, backwards in the sense that because I can't do the full integral for you, we're going to go ahead and jump to the method of regions. Okay? I'm going to argue for you what regions contribute to this process. And then um, we're going to, uh, we already talked about this one last time, right? Um, so we're going to look at what regions contribute to this process, and then, um, of course, they're going to be the uh, SCT1 regions, and then we're going to evaluate those individual integrals. I'll write down the integral and the answer for you and uh, refer you to either my lecture notes or the, um, or the Beneke lectures, and then, um, and then we'll see explicitly how the scale separation works and how things recombine to give you a log squared of only physical scales. Okay? So... Um, before we get there, there's one more thing that uh, I want to say, which is just to give you some intuition about this difference between resumming IR logs versus UV logs. This is really what the effective theory is doing for us. So it maps IR logs into UV logs. And let me just write a really schematic kind of dumb example. 
So I have some integral. I'm going to regulate it with some uh, epsilon in the IR, OK, just some regulator. And I have dx, 1 over x squared, right? So this is, uh, in principle, IR divergent. And gives us 1 over epsilon IR, right? So when I integrate this, I get something that depends on my IR cutoff. If I take the IR cutoff to 0, it diverges. So that's what the cutoff does for us. So all that the effective theory is doing at some level is we introduce the matching scale in the UV, epsilon UV. And then we integrate now from epsilon IR to epsilon UV, dx 1 over x squared, plus the integral from epsilon UV to infinity, dx 1 over x squared. This gives us 1 over epsilon IR minus 1 over epsilon UV. Boy. Minus 1 over epsilon UV, or plus. And we get back, obviously, the same integral, right? I didn't do anything except split it into two. But this is exactly what we're doing. So this is the EFT. And this is coming from matching, right? So, and then we regulate the IR of our EFT, either in the case we're going to look at today, we're going to have a physical mass. Uh, we're going to take the particle slightly off shell. I'll, I'll describe that in a moment. That'll give us an IR regulator. So there will technically be no actual infinities, right? There will just be the IR divergences that are regulated by the small mass. And we'll use DIMREG to regulate the UV. And then we can use renormalization group evolution, because we'll have MS bar uh, evaluated integrals. OK? So you'll hear people say this phrase, that IR logs become UV logs. This is all they're, this is all they're talking about. OK? And this is really just a, this is a pretty general phenomena for EFTs. I thought about saying this when we did our first example with the heavy light integral, but there are no IR divergences there. So, it, yeah. So, what we were, so, so I didn't want to confuse the point here. We're going to have honest to God IR divergences, and um, they're going to give us the famous Sudikov log, and, uh, and I'll show you how to take it apart and resum it. Yes? The second parentheses. You mean the oh, the, what I wrote here? Yeah, yeah. It's just one of epsilon uv, right? It's just this integral, right? I just I, I just did the I took the integral, right? I split it at epsilon uv, so I get now two contributions from each integral. That's all I'm saying. So yeah, so then the epsilon uv cancels, and you get back the full theory result, right? So this is schematically this is schematically matching, and this is the EFT. It's easy to say that, but that is a very clever trick. Uh, I've got to give the EFT folks props for that one. OK. So let's talk about the Sudikov integral. So here's our setting. Again, we imagine we have some source of energy. OK, it's PP collisions at the LHC, whatever it is. We don't need to worry about it because we're going to assume that the initial state factorizes from the final state, so there's no crosstalk, OK? All the initial state does is make two hard phi's for us, OK, with energy q squared. And let me draw this a little lower. What I want, the way I want you to think about what we're doing is it's a very silly model of jets, OK? So you can think about everything we're doing today as computing um, a back-to-back -back jet process where the jets have a small mass, okay? So, but really what we're, all we're going to do is we're going to take this process, right? We're going to make phi phi with, at high energy, and, the, um, and we're going to take these legs a little bit off shell, and that's going to regulate the IR divergences for us, okay? So we're going to have physical P1 squared, so let's call this P1, let's call this P2. So we'll have physical P1 squared non-zero. And guess what it's going to be? It's going to be lambda squared, right? So that's our power counting. So this is the sense in which we're looking at uh, 
So you could imagine this is a progenitor of a jet, right? So it's off shell because there's going to be a shower afterwards, right? That's going to take all of the uh, physical, and all of those physical particles will end up being on shell, right? But in order to have a shower of massless particles, you need this line to be off shell, okay? So, um, yeah, mathematically it's not so important, but I think physically it's very critical that we spend the next hour doing something where at least it's a toy model of physics, right? So, um, so yeah, if this uh, doesn't make sense, please holler and, and, and let's make sure we're on the same page here. Um, and then we're just going to compute this scalar integral with three propagators, but keeping p1 squared and p2 squared uh, non-zero. So this um, factors of two uh, are going to be correct in some places, but I'm no longer going to be super careful. Um, I'll get them all right in the notes. Sorry, there was a question? Oh. I know what you said, Tillman. <laughs> You're probably right. I'm at least going to try. All right, so, right, all I've done, we've got P1 flowing through this line, P2 flowing through this line, L is our loop integration, so I've taken, um, I've just chosen the momentum routing to look like this. Okay? So, first, what are the divergent properties, divergence properties of this integral? Is it UV divergent? No, right? Because I've got six L's in the denominator, four L's in the numerator, so I'm okay with UV. What about the IR? With P1 squared and P2 squared non-zero? It's also finite, right? This is the whole point, is that because I'm regulating these with non-zero masses, right, then uh, that's going to capture the IR divergence for us. We're going to get a Sudikov log squared as a function of physical parameters, Q squared, P1 squared, and P2 squared, okay? Um, it's going to turn out that the physical point is going to be with P1 squared and P2 squared negative, okay? So again, this is like a T-channel, right? In the T-channel, the momentum flowing through is negative, so it's, it's not, it's, it should be familiar, but you're going to see minus signs show up uh, in just a moment in the final result. Um, but, let's try to analyze this integral um, with our toy model of jets by using the method of regions. Um, so, unfortunately, because of time, uh, I really had wanted to spend like half an hour with us all doing this together um, and trying to figure out what the regions were, but, uh, but I think that um, I'll leave that for you as an exercise. So, definitely, offline, convince yourself that these are the only regions that contribute at order zero, uh, lambda to the zero, okay, order one. Um, just by taking any scaling of the three components of the momentum in the light cone coordinates that you can think of. But uh, I'm going to just jump in and show you hard, collinear, anti-collinear, and soft scalings and how that works. All right? So hopefully you remember from last time what to do with the method of regions. We have these denominators, L plus P squared. That's L squared plus P squared plus 2L dot P. Um, and let me write out, actually, this in light cone coordinates is n dot l m bar dot p plus n bar dot l n dot p plus l perp dot p perp. Notice I, I pointed out this minus sign thing last time. There's actually, when you, when you explicitly evaluate this, there's a minus sign because you should think of these as four vectors. It's not going to play a role today, but... Uh, just don't let that confuse you if you're tracking all the factors. Um, all right, let's focus on, um, well, I was going to do collinear first because I was going to actually do the integral for you. Uh, but since I'm going to skip it, maybe I should do for hard first. So let's see. Let's do the hard integral. So we're going to take order one scaling. So while I'm finding my page, think through what the denominator is going to look like when I take the scaling for L to be 1, 1, 1. So, what I need to do is compare, so this term is always going to remain L squared, right? There's nothing to compare to to Taylor expand, if you like, but with these two other terms, I have all of these different factors, and depending on the scaling I'm choosing, 
uh, I should keep them or not to leading power. So L, let's do hard. So L goes like 1, 1, 1. Let me remind you, this is, uh, where did I write it? Um, I don't want to get it wrong. Which one's N and N bar? Um, shoot. I know it's in here somewhere. I think it's N dot P and bar dot P P perp. Is that right? Somebody have it in front of them? Um, sorry? This is the hard region from, we did this yesterday too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was ones all across, right? Yeah. That's correct. Okay, thanks. Great. All right. So, um, so here it doesn't matter, but it'll matter in a moment. Let me just write it actually up here so we have it for reference. P is n dot p and bar dot p p perp because we'll look at all four of these scalings. All right. So here's how L scales. L squared is order one. P squared is order lambda squared. N dot L is order one. N bar dot P is uh, order one, right? Because this, OK. And then let me also be careful. So we're going to put P1 is collinear. So we'll have this be C. This goes like one lambda squared lambda. And we have collinear bar. P2 goes like, shoot, I got these backwards. Yeah, yeah. Lambda squared, 1. And this one goes like 1, lambda squared, lambda. And we'll have ultra soft is going to go like lambda squared, lambda squared, lambda squared. But those are the ones that uh, are trickier. OK, so P1, where were we? Uh, we're doing this for P1. So uh, P1, the end bar dot P is the order 1 component. So this survives. But this component dies, and this component dies, right? Those are subleading power. You can do the same thing for the denominator with P2 in it, right? You're just going to flip N and N bar. So we get the following for the hard integral. I muted the 2 epsilon integral dl, 1 over L squared. L squared plus 2 n bar dot p1 n dot l l squared plus 2 n dot p2 n bar dot l. Okay? And that we can evaluate. So it takes the following form. Um, this is I hard. It has a 1 over epsilon squared minus 1 over epsilon log mu squared over q squared plus 1 half log squared uh, mu squared over q squared minus pi over 6 and then plus higher order in power. Okay? We've got two divergences, so we got two 1 over epsilons. Um, we've got a single 1 over epsilon here that also needs, is going to have to cancel. Um, and then here's our physical, well, here's our Sudikov log, but since we separated it to regions, right, we have renormalization group dependence and the physical scale Q. The hard integral lives at the hard scale Q, so the natural scale to appear in its integral is Q squared. Okay, so everything hangs together. And so in order to do these integrals, uh, again, I recommend uh, spending at least 10 minutes or so uh, going through the derivation I put in the notes. Maybe I'll put this here. But there's a trick that you may not have seen before, that, um, which is a generalization of Feynman parameters. So if you have 1 over ABC, then um, this is 2 integral 0 to infinity, dx1 integral 0 to infinity dx2, 1 over a plus bx plus cx2 cubed. Okay, so this is what you do when you have linear integrals. 
Um, so here, I'm not sure this is actually, this is the right one for the collinear integral. Um, but, um, but the point is that now we have linear in L, okay? So we, if you combine denominators this way, you'll get to a form that looks like something you can then shift the momentum on the way you're familiar with and then apply the, the standard formulas for Dimrag, okay? I think, yeah, this was the one for collinear. Yeah, we'll write collinear next, but um, anyway, this is, uh, again, these, are, these formulas are in any number, any of these reviews. Um, I'll put them in mine as well, but uh, I just wanted to make you aware, right, of a different Feynman parameter trick that's, um, that's necessary for doing linear integral. Linear, uh, d when you have linear momentum in the denominators, which is not something you're familiar with from a Lorentz invariant uh, point of view. Nope. Uh, nope. Yeah, no. And just, yeah, for my own, since I was telling you guys this, I, put, I plugged this one into Mathematica, and it, it sure, sure enough it works. Um, OK. So um, now let's do the collinear. What am I doing on time? All right. Um, so the collinear integral. Now we assume L scales like collinear momentum. So L goes like lambda squared 1 lambda. And this gives us the collinear integral i mu to the 2 epsilon integral dl 1 over l squared l plus p1 squared 2 n bar dot p 2 n dot l. Okay? And this is after many pages. It's going to be fun. It's too bad. Um, L plus P1. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Did I make any other typos? I dropped the A squared. Um, this one is 1 plus epsilon over Q squared minus 1 over epsilon squared minus 1 over epsilon log mu squared over minus P1 squared minus a half log squared mu squared over p1 squared with a minus plus pi over 6, pi squared over 6 plus order lambda. Anticollinear is very easy to do from here. What do you do to go to anticollinear? Did I screw up? Um, we need the leading power contribution. So, um, oh, I forgot the squared there. Um, could easily be typos all over my notes. Um, Bar dot P2. So n dot L is good. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. Yeah? Yeah? Nope. Uh, I said earlier that P1 squared is going to be negative in the physical region. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, how do I get the anticollinear integral? Yep. So I won't. Um, where is it? Oh, my notes are out of order. Um, Anticollinear integral is you switch P1 and P2. So you get gamma 1 plus epsilon over Q squared. Um, 1 over epsilon squared plus 1 over epsilon. Ah, I'm writing on the wrong line. These are minus signs. Um, times log mu squared over P2 squared with a minus sign minus a half log squared 
mu squared over minus p2 squared plus pi squared over 6 plus order lambda. Okay. And finally, i ultra soft. Here I'll write it out. It's i mu to the 2 epsilon in a grill dl 1 over l squared 2 n bar dot p1 n dot l plus p1 squared 2 n dot p2 n bar dot l plus p2 squared. And that is gamma 1 plus epsilon over q squared 1 over epsilon squared plus 1 over epsilon log mu squared q squared over p1 squared p2 squared uh, plus a half log squared mu squared q squared over p1 squared p2 squared plus pi squared over 6 plus order lambda. All right. Ooh, I didn't even do anything. Um, so here we have the claim is that these are all of the order one regions. Okay. So let's take a moment to just enjoy them. We can add them together. So we have 1 over epsilon squared here, 1 over epsilon squared here, and 2 minus 1 over epsilon squared. So the, uh, the, that divergence disappears, right? That UV divergence. We've got similarly with our 1 over epsilon log mu squared terms, um, the mu squared dependence, right? Because we've got 2 plus and 2 minus all disappears. Um, similarly, because of the structure of the finite terms, here we have q squared, p1 squared, p2 squared, and then we have p2 squared, q squared, and p1 squared. So the finite parts of these, or the non mu dependent parts of these, are also going to cancel, right? So we're going to get rid of the 1 over epsilon. I did that a little fast, but you can convince yourself offline if you don't see it. And then we'll just be left with these double logs, which are magically going to combine to eliminate all of the mu squared dependence. Got to be a little careful because um, it's log squared. So when you do this at home, um, yeah, you just can't naively combine them, right? Because it's squared, but it works out. And you get the total integral. Oh, you shouldn't write down here, right? Shoot. Um, maybe I'll put it over there. So our total integral now. is 1 over q squared log q squared over minus p1 squared uh, log q squared over minus p2 squared plus pi squared over 3 plus order lambda. Okay? So here's our Sudikov log that we want to resum, right? It depends on these uh, small masses. It, this is a large log. Right, because this is our power counting showing up in each log. So we've got a log squared of lambda, right? If p1 squared and p2 squared are equal or the same order. And um, using the method of regions, right, doing this decomposition into these modes, um, we now have a set of individually mu v divergent, mu dependent quantities that we can then use to resum. Okay? So we've, just like we did in our heavy light case, We've taken a log with no mu's in it, and we've separated it into these many pieces that are mu dependent. Okay? So we see the separation of scales. Um, let's see, anything else I want to say here? Notice also that the whole thing is proportional to 1 over q squared. If you were paying attention, you might have remembered uh, that my interaction was, had mass dimension 1, right? So really, this is. Uh, if I were being less sloppy, I'd put my little a here. So you should think about the region where of, um, of parameter space where resummation is important is when my a and my q are, are roughly the same order. So if you like this combination, you can think of as the effective coupling constant. Of course, in gauge theory, exactly all of the same structure emerges. And uh, here it's just a dimensionless coupling, right? Um, but in Becker's notes, he takes it this far, basically, and then he says, well, I don't like that this is dimensionful because I don't want to resum this dimensionful thing. I'm going to go to six dimensions. So he pulls Shredniki's trick, right, and does um, 
phi cubed in six dimensions where the, where the coupling is dimensionless and then does the resummation there. But because now he's doing an integral in six dimensions, he doesn't have the ultra soft region anymore, so it's pretty different. Um, and so uh, I, I just prefer this example, so that's why we're doing this. And um, yeah, because I think it's nice because it exposes the soft physics, which, which behaves kind of differently than the collinear physics, as you'll see in a moment. Yeah, please. Uh, you would find uh, um, you would find subleading power. I think that's what happens. Um, yeah, but you should try it, and you should definitely um, take a general. Just it, it's easy, right? So you just play with some general um, lambda 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 to different powers, and you'll quickly see. Oh, I actually have a note. Aha! Thanks for the question. I wrote down somewhere the the so-called Glauber region, um, which is uh, so. So some, in some processes, there's, there can be a contribution from this uh, so-called Glauber region. So this is just to give you an example of a region that sometimes contributes. Um, this gives uh, scaleless. So this one I know for sure gives you a scaleless integral. So I definitely would recommend uh, taking five minutes and convincing yourself of that, right? So. Um, that's a place where, uh, where you can actually have a mode in QCD, it just doesn't uh, participate in this process, it drops out. Yes, please. Okay, let's do the, let's do the power counting. This goes like what? So I've, did I write ultra soft? Ultra soft is um, P, ultra soft is lambda squared, lambda squared, Lambda squared, right? So what is D4L? Lambda to the 8. I've got lambda squared here, so that's what? Lambda 4. It's an 8. Here, I've got, uh, yeah, you're going probably too fast for some people at least. Um, I've got n bar dot P, okay? Uh, P1, so that is uh, the order 1 part, right? And it's multiplied by L, which goes like lambda squared, so that gives me a lambda squared. Similarly, I have P1 squared. That goes like lambda squared. OK, that's why we kept both of these terms. Similar here, I slip, flipped n and n bar. So this is the order 1 part. And similarly, I get lambda squared. And so you get order 1. Good? So then the same thing. I didn't do the same exercise for collinear and anticollinear, but you should at home and convince yourself that they also contributed order 1. OK? Everything, the claim is that everything else you could try is either scaleless, you expand away all the dimensionful stuff, or is subleading power. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. At, well, so uh, so you can actually get lambda to a negative power. Um, it turns out that that ends up, uh, at least in the example I'm most familiar with, which is Wino annihilation, that ends up contributing to what's called the potential region, um, and that's the avatar of the Sommerfeld effect. So uh, I'm really hoping I have a few minutes, or maybe I'll like informally at the end, uh, I could tell you guys a little bit about Wino annihilation, since we're here mostly thinking about dark matter, um, which is a place where all of this technology is necessary. Um, and, uh, but I, yeah, I unfortunately will probably not have time. Um. Mm -hmm. No, lam lambda, yeah, don't, there, everything is tildes, right? When you're talking about the scaling, I'm not literally sending P1 squared to la equal lambda. I'm just asking, I want to do Taylor expansions, right? So I'm just expanding in some small parameter. Positive or negative doesn't matter when you're doing that. Okay. okay? What does it mean if P1 squared is negative? That's like a T-channel process. That happens in, in oh, okay. normal field theory, right? So. Uh, just in case we don't get to it, do you happen to have a reference for uh, applications of this code? Yeah, um, so, uh, well, I've been a part of, uh, we're finishing up a third paper, but there's a couple of papers by me um, and collaborators. There's uh, papers out of MIT, um, so Tracy is a part of that collaboration. Now we're all together, and, um, and then the, uh, there's some papers out of Carnegie Mellon. Although the, the approach we're taking here is much closer to what's done in, um, in my first paper, which is uh, SCET for WIMP Annihilation, I think is what it's called with Hill, Bauer, and Salone. And then um, the 
Tracy had a, a, a paper, a very similar paper around the same time that was short, and then she and her group did a, um, have a much longer version of that calculation that came out now, I think, a year and a half ago or so. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there, uh, if you look for um, me or Tracy and you put SCET in the title, or soft in the title, I think, I think we spelled it out, then you'll find all these papers. Um, or or uh, the Carnegie Mellon folks, Matt Baumgart and Varun Vita. Um, it's another collaboration. Actually, and then, um, so just recently, um, Martin Beneke, uh, he just put out a paper a couple of weeks ago. Um, but um, we can talk about that offline. It's, uh, I would definitely look at, well, I would recommend my own. We tried to be extremely pedagogical, and we do um, all of this in, in a lot of detail. So there are these, uh, um, I had to convince my uh, EFT collaborators who are more serious than I am to let me put blue boxes in the paper. But you'll see if you flip through, there are uh, four blue boxes. And they summarize the various stages of um, the one loop uh, power expanded calculation in, the full in just the full theory. And then um, the various EFT contributions, the matching, the running, and the low scale uh, corrections. So you can, so just like what we did Wednesday, you can see all of those pieces for Wino annihilation just by looking at the blue boxes. Um, and it's all at one, and it's all includes the one loop corrections, which numerically don't matter, but uh, but are really nice because then you can see all of the physics that we um, that we saw last time, and we'll see a little bit of today play out um, in the calculation. Okay, yeah, great. So ooh, we have half an hour. Um, all right, so now let's construct an EFT. And the point of this is to, um, so fine, we've evaluated this integral, but if we want to talk about resummation in any sensible, sensible way, we need to talk about, uh, well, at least from an EFT perspective, there are other approaches, then we need to have degrees of freedom, we need to have Wilson coefficients, right, to actually uh, compute some kind of, uh, some kind of kallen zamanzig equation on, okay? So what we want to do is we want to do what we did yesterday with the heavy light integral, and we want to map from regions to a hard interaction which we absorb into the Wilson coefficient because that only depends on Q, the big Q, which is the analog of our big M in yesterday's calculation. And then we have these light degrees of freedom, uh, these two collinear modes, C and C bar, and a soft mode. So we're going to have three fields emerge in the IR, and we're going to need all of them in order to correctly reproduce uh, the or turn these integrals into effective field theory diagrams, okay, and reproduce the expansion diagrammatically. So, how do we do that? Underlying all of this, and here's where, here's where uh, I'm going to be just trying to give you a flavor of how this works. Um, and then you'll either have to start digging into the existing articles or wait for my notes to get a lot of these details, unfortunately. Or invite me back. Um, so, so what we do, we expand our full theory field phi into phi c plus phi c bar plus phi. Uh, US. Okay? This is called a multipole expansion. And formally, what we're doing is we're writing something like phi um, with some kind of affine parameter t is a sum i equals zero to infinity, uh, t to the i over i factorial m bar dot partial to the i phi c of x. Okay, so this is just translating us in the, uh, in the n bar direction, right? Um, but you can do this multipole expansion to take the full theory with phi cubed in it and figure out what the effective theory interactions look like. So, oh, yeah, and I was going to write just to just to address this a little more, if we have our operator, so we'll call this O phi phi, this says the, the J I was talking about last time, or this operator creates two phi's for us, um, we can write this as an integral over ds dt um, c, which is the Wilson coefficient, s t mu, and then phi c x plus s n bar, and phi c bar 
x plus t n. Okay? So this is the operator in the effective theory that's going to create our back to back jets. Okay? Um, so, um, I tried to make this point carefully in the simpler example that we studied for Monday through Wednesday. Um, but the one, one of the things that I think is really confusing about this stuff when you're coming at it from the outside is um, there's a division into what I like to call and what's usually called the propagating degrees of freedom or the propagating Lagrangian and the local operators. So um, for us, when we did this in the uh, heavy light case, right, we had a phi to the fourth um, interaction, a phi to the sixth interaction. From this point of view, you can think of those as the local operators, okay? So those are evaluated at a space-time point, right? It's at some number of the fields, and, um, and it's the, that's the thing that actually creates the physical process for you, right? So it's a matrix element of the local operator that's going to generate our back-to-back -back jets, right? So this is a local operator. It is existing at this space-time point, all right? Um, that's to be contrast with the propagating degrees of freedom and their interactions. So the way this works is um, the simplest case, if you're just looking to resum the Sudikov log, you want to take the local operator that generates phi phi for you, okay? And then you want to dress that with loops of the propagating degrees of freedom in the effective theory, the collinear and the soft modes, and those are going to reproduce these uh, integrals for us, okay? So the hard integral is going to be reproduced by matching onto a full theory, and the, um, and the rest of these three are going to be reproduced by loops involving these propagating degrees of freedom. So that's what the multipole expansion is going to give us. It's going to give us um, the mapping from the full theory to the interactions in the effective theory for these propagating degrees of freedom. And in the SCT, it's actually pretty intuitive what interactions you're allowed to have and which ones you aren't because our power counting has to do with momentum. And so the only interactions we can have respect the power counting. Okay? That's really what the multipole expansion is doing for you. It's a power expansion. And so let me just show you. Here are the... Um, all right, I have to be careful not to erase the wrong things. Let's erase this. Um, so here are the phi cubed interactions in our EFT. So we have, um, our L propagating. Um, includes the kinetic terms for all of them. Since we're doing scalars, it's still phi box phi, okay? Um, if we were doing fermions or gauge bosons, with gauge bosons you actually end up with the same f mu nu, f mu nu uh, when, you, when, you, when you do this, uh, for the kinetic term at least, so the abelian part. Um, and then the interactions need to respect the power counting, right? Because you've taken one gauge field and split it into soft and collinear pieces. Um, but uh, fermions actually are really cool, and uh, I'm not going to have time to, to show you how that works, but um, you, we can chat about it afterwards, or, uh, um, yeah, or you can, uh, there, I, I, I think I mentioned this before, we have this, uh, I think we have a really clean derivation in some of this uh, SCT and SUSY stuff I've, I've been up to in the last year or two, um, so you can check it out there. Um, but anyway, so this is just the normal kinetic term for scalars, okay, and then, um, we have our coupling, and we have phi c cubed over 3 factorial plus phi c bar cubed over 3 factorial plus phi s cubed, or ultra soft, over 3 factorial plus phi c squared phi s over 2 plus phi c bar squared phi s over 2. So what does this mean? This means one collinear particle can split into two collinear particles in the same direction and maintain the power counting, right? Similar for anticollinear, similar ultra soft is, you know, it's just isotropic, so it just says a soft thing can split into multiple soft things. Um, these are more interesting. So this is a collinear particle can turn into a collinear particle and a soft particle, right? Similar, an anticollinear particle can turn into an anticollinear particle and a soft particle. And here are the kinds of things we throw away. So I think this is the full list. Phi C, Phi S squared. Phi C, Phi C bar squared. Phi C, Phi C bar, Phi S. Okay, so these don't respect momentum conservation 
uh, to order lambda. So this is saying I have a, a hard line that splits into two soft things, right? So that violates momentum conservation. This, I have a hard line that turns into two collinear things in the opposite direction, right? Clearly violates momentum conservation. Similar with this, a collinear thing becomes an anti-collinear thing and a soft thing, right? So because, maybe I didn't say this uh, super clearly, right? We kind of talked about it last time. You really should think about what we're doing is, at least from the point of view of the collinear, is we're just integrating within lambda squared of this light cone, right? So we really are integrating around something that looks like a jet, right? Um, certainly has the, um, and the, the virtuality is at some level the distance from this line, right? And then the soft stuff is just everywhere, um, but, uh, but it's a very low momentum, right? So we can't exchange a large amount of momentum with the soft background, right? Okay. So, next, I want to expose you to um, another really non-trivial thing that happens in SCET and one of these like brilliant simplifications uh, that was realized by uh, some, of its, uh, some of its founders in the early days, which is that um, the, follow so, uh, the following structures emerge. All right, now, now I think I'm in trouble. Um, so, So let's take our phi phi operator and let's think about matching from the full theory to the effective theory. So we've got n bar dot p is order one. So in the full theory, we can draw diagrams like this. So here, um, I'm just going to label them a little differently for the moment, just because I want these two to be together and this one to be separate. So I've got a P, a K1, and a K2, OK? Um, the direction of P is not so important. Uh, right? So I can do this, and I can do this, where this is P, this is K1, or K2, and this is K1, OK? Um, so the idea is K2 and K1 are collinear to each other, and P is in the anti-collinear direction, okay? So this is like a C bar, like a C and like a C, and so on. Why, why, uh, why do we keep phi C and Q in this instance? I mean, it, the, it's order one momentum along the jet, right? So doesn't momentum conservation rule that out? Um, so, uh, if you're really going collinear, right, then your order one thing is becoming a half, but that's still order one, okay. right? So you're like, right, or you're splitting, you're splitting an order one fraction of the, of the large momentum into two pieces, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, that's the best physical intuition I could give you. You can also, if you don't believe it, you can do the multipole expansion, and that'll formally give you the right answer, okay? But yeah. Um, okay, so this is in the full theory side. Sorry, should I, maybe if I, you guys won't be confused if I draw solid lines, right? There are only scalars in the game. I think that's better. Okay, so we've got these two kind of structures in the full theory. Now let's look at what those look like in the EFT. So in the EFT, now for because of exactly the rules we were just discussing, I can have C bar, C, C, and C, right? But I can't put this on this line because that would violate the momentum conservation in the EFT. In other words, uh, I don't have the C bar CC operator, right? Interaction in the propagating Lagrangian. But we're in an EFT. So why not include something like that too, right? So here we have a C bar CC, okay? So it turns out, unsurprisingly, these two things are identical. So when we match, their contribution cancels from going from the full theory to the effective theory. So these cancel in matching. But here, 
what we really mean when we go from this to this, well, uh, okay, good. Um, what, why should you object to this uh, naively? No, I can point, uh, this, this is fine, right? I point these in one direction. Like, the way I drew the diagram is okay. just schematic, right? I mean, this is really back-to-back, -back, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's no momentum problem. What do we do when we construct the EFT? What's the thing I've been harping on over and over? Symmetries. Sorry? Pick a process, sure, but uh, we've already done that, right? We're studying the pseudocup process. Um, power counting, right? This naively has more legs, right? So you might worry that it's uh, subleading in power, okay? But here's the, here's the crucial point, is that this propagator is the large component of the momentum. So this is order one. So that means, from the point of view of the EFT, I can shrink this to uh, be absorbed into my local operator, right? That's what it means to go to the EFT. And so I'm allowed to do this at leading power because this intermediate propagator is order one. All right? And that means there's nothing, you know, what stops you from writing down an interaction with a billion particles in it? It's power counting. But here I'm telling you that the power counting lets me draw as many of these lines as I want. So in the EFT, my local operator is really this plus, well, this is C bar, and the rest are going to be Cs, right? Well, I should put dot, dot, dot. OK? So there are two points of view you can take. You could just include a tower of these operators in your effective theory description. Or you could do a field redefinition, because the physics is independent of field redefinitions, right? We, said, we talked about that on the first day, and absorb this tower of operators into some new structure. Does anybody know what that structure is? Yeah, it's a Wilson line, right? So this tells us that we should use or do a field redefinition with a Wilson line. So if you dig into any of the SCET literature, you'll hit Wilson lines almost immediately, OK? Um, they're really useful. I, I, again, I hope I'll say a few words about gauge theory at the end. They're really useful for gauge theory because they also um, encode the gauge transformation properties, OK? Um, but for us, we've got no gauge anything, but we still need the Wilson lines because of, uh, because of this fact that we've got this order one momentum in our propagator flowing, uh, 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 hanging out, right? So we can do this without paying a power counting cost. Um, so we resum these by defining a Wilson line. And I'll just give you a momentum space definition. Um, so W in P space takes the following form. It's pretty intuitive. It's an exponential. So it's a sum over permutations. Um, exponential of minus a over n bar dot p phi c. Okay? So again, this is just this propagator, right, integrating this out. It's order one for phi c, and we can do it an infinite number of times, so we might as well be smart about it and reabsorb that into our definition of the field. So now, our local operator is not phi squared, okay? So what does it mean to do a field redefinition like that? It means that our operator is now, we take phi and we replace it with w phi, okay? And so now our local operator is schematically w squared, well, I should be less schematic, w in the collinear direction phi c, w in the anticollinear direction phi c bar. So this encodes an infinite number of interaction vertices, okay? And then, Depending on what order you're going to, you may need to expand the Wilson line to higher and higher orders in the fields in order to get um, to capture all of the physics. For us, we're only going to need to go to three legs. Okay. But this gives us this tower of uh, local operators. Okay. So that's why in SCET you see weird diagrams that look like this. 
So let's talk about our process in the EFT. Tree level is just that with a C and a C bar. And then in the collinear sector, the one loop process looks like the following. Okay? So I've used my expanded out Wilson line to give me a three particle vertex. And I've used my propagating Lagrangian to close this off and make a loop. Okay, so this is giving me my uh, one loop correction to my pseudocop process in the collinear sector. So, let's figure out what the scaling is here. No, no. Yeah, of course, of course. Please. Uh, so this this infinite thing. At yeah. some point, do we have to truncate it just because we're splitting it too much? <laughs> um, splitting like momentum too much. Yeah. So so look at so take this diagram, right? Um, really, what we're doing is we're using it as this interaction vertex, but but ultimately it's recombining. So you could go to higher and higher loops, uh, right? And you're still um, right. So it really again it depends on the process you're doing. Um, but uh, in practice, I mean, I actually don't know what the state of the art is for the, the sort of number of external legs people have used for these calculations. But um, it's almost always uh, some version of a two to two process. And then you should really think about these as jets. And in fact, um, this is one of the really nice pieces of physics that I don't have time to go into, is that the Wilson lines have a very physical interpretation in terms, especially for the soft Wilson lines. Um, those just show up in like world line field theory they resum all of the soft interactions around, say, a propagating electron, right? So there's a whole Wilson line formalism for uh, like a world line electron. You dress it with a Wilson line, it makes it a gauge invariant object. Um, and so, uh, so they're, they're, they're very physical, right? At some level, this is the, the more physical basis. Now that we have a light cone to talk about, we might as well um, absorb all of these interactions along the light cone into the Wilson line. Um, please. So I don't I don't think so because there you do it because of symmetries right it's a Goldstone boson here there's no Goldstone bosons we just have a hard breaking of Lorentz invariance okay. yeah um, there, there easily could be a deeper connection I'm unaware of but I think at the surface level they're pretty different yeah um, okay so let me show you how to write down this integral. We have all the tools we need. We have an insertion of our local operator. Um, I'm just going to let that be a 1. But that's our, uh, our Wilson coefficient. And then the loop goes like integral dl, um, 1 over n dot l, 1 over l plus p1 squared. And L squared. Um, so let's see if I got my bar right. Maybe not. This should be the collinear integral, which is up there. No, I got it wrong. This is anti-collinear. Um, yeah, so then I flipped either the P1 or the, um, yeah. So let's, uh, let's do some blackboard magic. I think that's the right answer. Okay. Um, should be sorry. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. thanks. Um, so, um, so again, I have this vertex right with three phi's in it. I have now my propagator, the kinetic term. Did I? I think I erased it, right? But the kinetic term is just the standard scalar propagator. So that that shows up here and here, and then this comes from the Wilson line, right? So the Wilson line gives us this weird linear propagator that showed up when we did the, uh, the method of regions. Okay? So this is how these two things connect. This is what we mean when we say that we're going to write down an effective field theory that reproduces these integrals. Okay? It's through this kind of uh, weird looking interactions that, uh, that might, are, are likely unfamiliar. Okay? Um, yes? Uh, yeah, so this is the Wilson coefficient. So there's some, um, 
well, I don't want the C's to get, uh, let me call it like alpha or something, right? So then there'd be an alpha here. Uh, and it would need to be dimension one in this case. So again, the thing we're resumming, right, is this, uh, well, it's, is this A squared over Q squared kind of thing, yeah. So, so again, I haven't been careful about any of the matching or the factors. Um, I just want to give you the schematic understanding of, um, of how, this all, how this all works. Of course, all the factors of two hold together the way that they did in the, when we did the more careful case. Um, um, the UV, com in this particular example, I would say the UV completion does. We just match, right? So I think it really probably, up to factors of two, it must be A. Um, because this is the two point, this is the same thing generated by A. So I'm pretty sure it's A. I just, yeah, like I said, I wasn't careful about that. Uh, good, so then it's, yeah. Um, oh, you know what, it's A, no, A is in the, no, no, this is an A, and then there's an A here, right? Yeah, so then this is A squared. Right, so you do tree level matching to get the coefficient here and to get the coefficients in the propagating Lagrangian. And then we're doing one loop calculation with those tree level matching coefficients. Um, but really, okay, but really what you should do is you should leave this as, you know, C two point or something. And then it's this thing that you resum in the effective theory, right? In the way that when I was just, so this is why I was so careful in those other examples, because I knew I was going to not have time to be careful here, um, is that, uh, right, we, we changed the name of the variable when we matched, right, uh, because it really is a different theory. So the same thing happens here, right, and we're going to, in particular, right, this thing has a different anomalous dimension than the A uh, coefficient does in the full theory, right? So, yeah, so you want to use all the same effective field theory philosophy um, to, to work out all of these details. Um, yes, please. Not in this case. So in this case, the kinetic terms are all order one. Um, and, uh, and it's actually uh, um, it's the same argument we used in the heavy light case, right? So you can just take, because you, you have derivatives there, so that gives you momentum. And you can use that to see box scales like lambda squared, right? Because it's like p squared. And so then the fields are going to scale like lambda for the collinear and anticollinear. And then for the ultra soft, box scales like lambda to the fourth, right? So the fields are going to scale like order one. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. The fields are also are going to scale like lambda squared because the measure scales like uh, one over lambda to the eighth. Yeah. You do, but when you use box, it's n dot it's it's n dot p and bar dot p. So then, exactly. So scalars are, are trivial. Fermions are really interesting. Um, in the fermion Lagrangian, you actually end up with um, with what looks like a non-locality. So you have um, I could just write it to at least up to factors of two. If we had fermions, then uh, the kinetic term for fermions looks like this. And again, I, I think this is right. It's an I maybe. So somebody could double check me, or you can go look it up. But it's something like this. I think this is right. Maybe there's a minus sign. Um, but it has this, uh, this seemingly non-local term, but this is the large momentum. So you can have this in the denominator without causing any problems. Um, this, it turns out, is actually the avatar of the fact that you have uh, integrated out the helicity pointing in the other direction. So this thing, so this is a fermion that's uh, one of the helicities, let's say it's aligned with the momentum, and uh, because QCD doesn't have any helicity flipping interactions, when you do QCD, you just need this to describe a propagating fermion a quark. And, um, and then this stays large because you're always within the light cone. This would blow up if you tried to flip the helicity by turning the particle all the way around, which would make this small and give you something infinite telling you you were missing degrees of freedom in your description. OK? Um, so yeah, this is a, and the derivation of this is cool and, and, and illustrates some nice stuff in light cone coordinates. But um, yeah. We're, We've got five minutes, so um, I'll try not to go too long. I know you guys are exhausted. Um, okay, I just want to sketch. I'm not going to do any of the details. 
Um, but I want to tell you where the soft integral comes from, and then I want to just say a couple of words about resummation, and then I'll probably end, and then maybe we can, uh, those of you who want to stick around, we could talk about uh, some other stuff, but I don't want to trap everybody um, for another half an hour or something. Um, so the soft sector is pretty subtle. Um, I'm going to try to do a really uh, careful job of this in my notes. I actually got pretty confused today. Uh, so um, I'm going to try to uh, remember that confusion when I write things up so I can try to point out some stuff. Um, just, just a note, uh, for technical reasons, um, I'm going to talk to my friends to get some intuition here. I, I, I think I have a, a rough idea of why you should work in position space, usually for the soft function. It's basically because um, here are the, uh, so you'll see diagrams like this, where um, all the lines are soft. And, um, but really, this line and this line are coming from a soft Wilson line. So you play the same kind of game where you need to include soft Wilson lines. And so this diagram is really more like an interaction, including the soft structure, and a single uh, soft loop. Okay? And that gives you um, something that looks like the following integral dl, 1 over l squared 2n dot l m bar dot p plus p1 squared 2n bar dot l n dot p2 plus p2 squared, which is, of course, the ultra soft integral. This l squared is the loop. And the rest of this structure comes from being really careful about what you, what you mean by these Wilson lines. Okay? So I'm not showing you how that works. But um, yeah, you'll have to uh, do some homework or, um, or wait for my lecture notes to come out to see that. Um, OK, so of course, there's this diagram. There's the other one with the uh, loop on the anticollinear line. right? So now we have our three integrals in the effective theory. We have our soft integral. We have our two collinear integrals. And the hard integral is just the matching coefficient, right? So that comes from matching. It's really the full theory minus the other three, right? So just by simple addition, right? It has to be, um, it has to be this, because that's what's left over when you subtract the other three. And, um, and so this is how the dynamics reproduces the regions in the effective theory, OK? Um, so uh, good. So there are two more things I want to say before I close. One is um, one of the really important aspects of uh, SCET, but also um, a lot of these EFTs in general, heavy quark effective theory, um, and is, uh, is the idea of factorization. Okay? So um, let me go back to. So with factorization, it turns out there's another really cool thing about uh, this Wilson line redefinition. If you do. Uh, the field redefinition using the soft Wilson line and the collinear Wilson lines, then um, what you find is that to leading power, the Lagrangians are independent of each other. So the Wilson line field redefinitions imply that L is L collinear plus L, L anticollinear plus L soft plus order lambda. Sorry. Okay? So in our original Lagrangian, right, we had interactions between these sectors, but when you use the Wilson lines, you can decouple them from each other. And, um, and this lets you treat each of these as independent. And then um, you can just focus in on one of them, right? and do as, uh, as hard of a calculation as you want in that particular setting. And you will ultimately write your amplitude as some hard coefficient times what's usually called the jet function. Um, well, I'm, ah, let me write the scales. So this. Right, is a function of q squared and mu. Then the collinear jet function is a function of p1 squared and mu. The anticollinear function is p2 squared and mu. And then the soft function or the ultra soft function is, um, is that final combination p1 squared, p2 squared over q squared. 
and then mu. Right? That's lambda to the fourth. Um, so the point is that we have factorized our problem into these individual pieces, okay? And then you can run each of them individually. You can compute the anomalous dimension separately, and then you just need to run the whole thing to the same scale, okay? Some convenient point. And this is why I didn't erase any of this stuff, because if you look at, for example, um, let's look at the collinear integrals. So if you look at the collinear integral, right, this is the log we're trying to resum. And so I have to take this scale to be somewhere. I can take it at some convenient point. But notice that I cannot simultaneously minimize this log. Well, these two are at the same scale, right? But I can't simultaneously minimize those logs, which have a lambda squared, this log, which has a lambda to the fourth, and this log here from the hard function, which has um, an order one, right? It's, it's mu over q. And so this is the, if you like, from the EFT point of view, this is the source of the large logarithms. But now we can resum the large, large logarithms because we have the kalins amanzik equation, right? Because we have mu's around. So um, in particular, you can compute just from these expressions, it's pretty easy, these one-loop things. You could just take the derivative with respect to log mu. Um, after subtraction, getting rid of the 1 over epsilons, and you just get a hard uh, anomalous dimension, a squared over q squared, log mu squared over q squared. You get a collinear minus a squared over q squared, log mu squared over p1 squared, an anticollinear and a soft, right? You can infer what they are. I won't write them. But one of the things I wanted to show you, just because it's uh, unfamiliar, is your anomalous dimensions now depend on log mu. So when I integrate dc d log mu, um, I may not be, oh, you know what? This is exactly the point from that diagram. These should be like AC. OK? So, and then really it should be a single A because the anomalous mention gets dropped. The C gets dropped and it's really gamma times C, right? So we do each of these for each of the functions. And this gives us some, um, uh, tells us that the ratio of the C's, so C at mu high over C at mu low is mu high over mu low to the gamma, right? So this is the sense in one, at one loop at which we, um, we resum the large logs. And, um, and so integrating this um, gives, us the, um, gives us the running, resums the logs for each of these functions. And then we can just evaluate the whole thing at a convenient scale, OK? So just like what we did in the simpler example, Right, it's exactly the same philosophy. There's a little, there's a bunch of little wrinkles along the way. Um, doing these things carefully, of course, requires being being careful and tracking uh, a lot of subtlety. But ultimately, underlying it, it's just the same exact strategy that we used in the in the sort of simple heavy light integral uh, from before. Okay, um, and pictorially, you can think about this factorization in a nice way. So this process in the full theory becomes the following So we have the hard process we have jet at p1 squared we have jet at p2 squared and then we have this Wilson line description of the soft function so there's this soft stuff in the middle which gets connected to this Wilson line through soft propagating particles. Um, and it goes like p1 squared, p2 squared over q squared is its natural scale. right? So we have hard c and c bar and soft. And we can use renormalization group evolution, if you like, to run all of these down to the low scale and get a fully resummed result that behaves well in perturbation theory. One thing to notice um, is that uh, 
because of the consistency, the self-consistency of breaking the full theory integral apart into these different pieces, the anomalous dimensions have to sum to zero. So this is uh, because the full theory doesn't have any anomalous dimension, right? So what we've done is we've taken something that doesn't run, we've broken it into all these pieces that run so we can resum the logs. So if you're doing one of these calculations yourself, um, it is a great check, in fact, a highly non-trivial check to get the anomalous dimensions to sum to zero, okay? Um, so that's just a little bit of a, a strategic hint. Um, if you're off calculating or if you're skeptical of someone's result, check that and see, um, that's, a, that's a quick check. Uh, and it certainly is easy to see here. Um, the, uh, yeah, if you write out the, all of those anomalous dimensions by just taking the derivatives of these uh, four functions, you'll see in the same way that they combine um, the, the anomalous dimensions cancel. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a natural place to stop. Um, hopefully, uh, I've given you at least a sense of the technology that's required to work with these effective theories. I also really hope that you've gotten a sense of how to work with, um, with these non-trivial effective theories more generally, this idea of matching and running and separating scales. Um, these are really, really general ubiquitous concepts in, in physics and higher energy physics in particular. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe now when you go to an SET, an SET talk, you'll be able to follow uh, a little bit of what's going on. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, that's a nice place to stop. Uh, thanks so much. This has really been a blast and putting this together has been a lot of fun. Um, you guys are really great and I look forward to interacting for the rest of the day and seeing you all at conferences and so on down the road. All right, thanks. <laughs>